Hey YouTube, I'm Astrid, and this is the number three electronic switching system, also called the 3ESS. This is a, uh, an electronic telephone switching system um, built by the AT&T, the Western Electric, Bell Labs, whoever you want to call them, uh, the telephone company to many Americans. And it was uh, designed to act as a telephone switch for small towns and replace the existing step-by-step -step systems that were 1890s technology but were still very widely used up until the, the 1980s. This machine was designed in the late 1970s. Um, this one in particular was installed on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington in a town called Crosby in 1979. Um, it was there until the mid-1990s, at which time it came to our museum. The Connections Museum acquired this machine in the mid-1990s. It was set up and then it ran continuously up until approximately, I believe, 2012, at which point the computer which operates it crashed and we were not able to recover it. After this machine crashed in approximately 2012, uh, we attempted to restart it a number of times. Uh, from the, It was crashed, but the program was still loaded in memory. It boots off of magnetic tape, much like this one. These tapes are also known as quarter-inch cartridge tapes. They are a common format in the 1970s and 1980s. They're made by 3M, uh, with, of course, a few Bell System-specific twists, which makes it impossible to use commercial equipment to rebuild this machine. These tapes have several failure modes concurrently. One of them is that the, the tapes will relax when they're sitting on the reel, and so they accumulate too much slack. That's a normal problem, and you have to fix that by retensioning the tapes regularly. Another issue is that the capstan in the tape drive, which is a little rubber wheel, that rubber wheel, D, it falls apart. And so we had to get new rubber wheels made in the late 1990s, actually, because this machine was actually already starting to decay. Another failure that we've also discovered is that certain sectors will go bad on the tape because it's very old magnetic tape. And so we've done a variety of reconstructive techniques. Uh, we built a custom transport to haul this tape. This, we took the tape out of the cartridges and we hauled it past the correct read head on a custom built transport. All of this in order to get the data into an audio file. And then we performed a number of reconstructive techniques using Audacity and other software um, to create a digital copy of the tape. So what we've done is we've taken the ESS cartridge, which is no longer functional because the drive bands have all deteriorated, and we've uh, removed the tape from the cartridge and we've re-spooled it on a small reel, the low torque hub, and I've mounted an ESS number three head assembly from the tape drive on an Ampex 351 transport, tape transport, with a custom made head block to mount the head. And then uh, we're running the output of that which is a balanced output into the microphone input of this Tascam HDP2. And we're sampling at 192 uh, and uh, with a 24 bit depth. And uh, so we're just getting the raw signal off the tape. And it's as simple as that. It's just sort of like playing back a pre recorded uh, uh, quarter track tape back in 1974. Very cool, and uh, that's what the blocks sound like. By 2019, this project had gotten sufficiently advanced to a point where uh, our volunteer Chuck, who'd been working on maintaining the processors, had gotten them functioning and worked out enough enough bugs. There are some stuck gates and stuck bits in the memory. Um, and our other volunteer, Colin, had built replacement tape drive so that we could plug it into the existing tape drive and pretend to be a tape transport with the tape in it. So far, we've gotten it to the point where you can, in fact, see that it's running code. This Cylons pattern is, uh, the, is what the second stage bootloader puts on the display buffer to indicate that it's running successfully. This is a very small telephone switch, so the tour should only take a few minutes. Behind me is the control complex, 
This is two CPUs. There is the left one and the right one. They are both, when the machine is working correctly, they are both uh, functional. One of them is operational and the other, was in, the other one is in standby so that if the operational processor encounters a fault, it can switch immediately. It doesn't, they don't run at the same time, unlike in some other mis machines such as the number one ESS. They run separately. This allows for the online processor to send diagnostics to the offline processor. The next frame is the maintenance frame. Um, the maintenance frame has a tape drive, another tape drive, a bunch of buttons, a teletype, currently replaced by a computer, but the teletype is coming back. Below it, we have the serial ports. There are 16 serial ports in this machine, one for the teletype, several for modems, that sort of thing, a bunch of spares. And that's the maintenance frame. Then there's the test frame, which has uh, a trunk and line test panel, which functions very similarly to the local test desk and the trunk test desk in a more electromechanical telephone switch. Um, it provides the same sort of tests, some of the same keys, but it's fundamentally much more modern. Below there is a, an inverter so that the teletype can run off of the battery and instead of AC when the AC goes out. And then there's a miscellaneous frame which has all kinds of things. Um, when the machine was originally in service, there would have been uh, recorded announcement machines up here instead of a power bus. So this was a museum modification. Below it is some test circuitry and a couple of trunk circuits used for talking to other machines and for testing customer lines and that sort of thing. On the other side of the machine, we have uh, most of the analog circuitry. So this is the power frame. Uh, this frame ha handles the incoming 48 volts and converts it to 24 volts and 5 volts and 130 volts and a couple other voltages. The next frame over is the miscellaneous frame O, um, and it has uh, modems for talking to the long distance billing center. It has touch tone receivers so that customers can actually dial uh, because the machine has to listen to touch tones somehow and it's not smart enough to do that in the software. It uses hardware to do that. And then there is more modems. Those modems have to plug into something. And so there's actually a third t teletype controller back here, giving it another eight serial ports. And then trunk circuits, because they're everywhere. This next frame that I'm standing in front of is the network frame. All of the customer telephone lines come in on wires just like these, and they land on metallic terminals here. Those metallic terminals then go into uh, magnetically switched read relays. So it's a glass envelope with two metallic contacts in there. They're very small, and they can operate on very little power. In fact, they're magnetically sticky. So once the coil energizes them, it will stick closed or stick open, depending on what the software set it to. This, that means that this machine is completely analog as far as the customer is concerned. There is a computer in it, like we just saw, but that computer only tells this network when to open and close. That's very different from modern digital switches such as the, the DMS-10, which was built at the same time as this machine, and the 5ESS, which is what most uh, cities have these days. The, the software running on the central processor has no way of knowing what the current state of the network is. There's no there's no sense leads or anything like that. So it has to maintain its own separate record of what's what and what calls are up and where they are. And that means that if the, if the processor encounters an error that's sufficiently severe to cause it to reboot and also lose all of its information, then that means that all the calls that are on, in progress get dropped. These two frames are called the control. In a working office, you would have one control and anywhere between one and 16 network frames. 
the network frame can serve uh, 300 subscribers, and a fully kitted out office can have up to 4,500 lines. That'd be 16 network frames, but still just one control. This control frame has a number of circuits on it. Uh, most prominently is the pulsar circuit, which is what operates the, those magnetic coils in the network. This backplane that we're looking at right now is actually the rear side of the, of the central control, the processor. There are all these pins, and they are connected by a bunch of, you can see, 30 gauge wire wrap. This was wired by a machine, a, a robot wired this, and it connects all the cards together. The reason they did this, I'm not quite sure exactly why they did this instead of a PCB. Hmm. They used printed circuit boards in other, in other uh, parts of the machine. I believe the reason they used wire wrap is because that makes it much cheaper to make small design revisions because you only have to change the, um, the instructions you're giving to the robot that makes them rather than drawing up entirely new artwork. One of the most prominent features of this machine is the blue cables that go everywhere. These cables have uh, a twisted pair and a shield in them, so there's actually three conductors. Um, it's a differential signaling mechanism, and it's used to send uh, messages from the processor to various peripheral equipment, such as the tape drives. Every communication channel between the processor and uh, a peripheral has six cables. There is a transmit, receive, and an interrupt request for both uh, processor A and processor B to talk to that peripheral. So we have an HP logic analyzer from 1980-ish? Ish. Ish. Sometime a little bit after the computer itself was built. Um, it has 32 channels, and we plugged those channels into the tape drive controller circuit.